All right, hi, uh, my name is Scott Rolliter. I'm the uh, instructor up here at Billiard Factory. have quite a few new faces this time, so welcome. Um, I've been doing these monthly clinics for about five years. Uh, if it is your first time, uh, I do them the second Saturday of every month at 10 o'clock. Uh, occasionally we adjust it if I've got a tournament or something, but usually it's second Saturday. Um, I, I cover different topics every month. Uh, right now I'm in the middle of a kind of an eight part how to play pool series. So if you missed the first six parts, this is part seven today. Uh, if you missed the first six, they're on my YouTube channel. If you go to just look for Scott Rolliter, um, you can go to the Billiard Factory YouTube channel and I also have them on my web, uh, on my web page. Started with fundamentals and then went over English and shot making and kicking and banking systems and a whole bunch of stuff. So today I'm gonna be covering breaking, jumping, a little bit on like curve and masse shots and then kind of some specialty shots that'll get you out of a little trouble uh, if you need to. Um, so let me just go ahead and jump right in on the breaking. Um, honestly, uh, you know, if you're a lower ranked um, league player, breaking is important, but it's not uh, critical actually as you get even better and, and better in the game. Um, so if you're if you're an advanced player, uh, people start to transition to actually practicing their break uh, almost sometimes as much as they practice playing. Uh, Shane Van Boning can be seen at tournaments practicing his break for hours, doing nothing but just racking the balls and breaking. He already knows how to play. He already knows how to move the ball around the table. But if he's breaking better than his opponent, it's more likely he's going to win that match. Again, at my level, it's kind of 50-50. It's very important. Um, but I honestly don't put a ton of time of practice into my break like I should. I just find it kind of boring. Tournament or I play a match and I break really bad, then I kind of put a little extra practice in and kind of get things back together again. Um, in general, a lot of people I see casually around the pool room, they try to break too hard. Uh, you always see that person that hits the balls and the ball goes flying off the table like every other time or every third time. Accuracy is much more important than power. Power is great if you can control it and if you can um, manage to keep the balls on the table. But uh, typically what happens, just so everyone's aware, usually when the ball goes flying off the table like that, it's because when you're breaking with power, the ball does not stay on the table. The cue ball actually jumps off the table a little bit. And so when it hits the rack and it's kind of in midair, uh, it may only be a millimeter off the cloth, but it's actually in the air. So if you don't hit that ball perfectly square and it's kind of up in the air, it's going to go flying off that way. Um, if that same person that hit that kind of harder break hit the ball square, it's going to generally pop back onto the table and not go flying off the table. So you can grab a seat somewhere if you want. So uh, again, accuracy is... Uh, uh, much more important and what I always recommend with people when they're learning to break um, is to kind of start out with about 60 70 percent power and, and get it to where you can control the cue ball and achieve the desired result and then work on timing the rest of your swing and maybe adding a little body movement into it or whatever to try to hit the ball a little harder I'll talk a little bit about equipment um, again I remember when I first started playing I only had one cue it was probably a pretty cheap cue at that and I used it for playing, breaking, everything. Uh, as you get a little better, uh, most people want to get a separate break cue. It, it's not that the break cue, there is some technology in the break cues these days, but it's really more to uh, save your tip from getting beat up. Um, again, I don't know how much people pay attention. I'm pretty kind of picky about mine, but if you have a nice nickel or dime shape on your tip and I sit here and keep breaking with it over and over, it's going to flatten out and then I have to reshape it, and then it's gonna flatten out, and then it's gonna mushroom, and then I gotta reshape it again, and I just end up having to wear the tip down. And if I can avoid hitting a lot of hard shots with it, I can maintain the shape longer, and I don't have to kind of fiddle with my tip as much, which I don't like to do uh, as little as I can. So that's usually the reason for getting a break cue. Now again, some of the modern break cues, they're, they've got better technology, they're stiffer, the shaft is stiffer, it allows like a better energy transfer. Um, a lot of the brake cues have very hard uh, phenolic or plastic tips on them or very hard leather tips on them. And 
it actually does two things. One, it minimizes any kind of cushioning response so that it, you deliver as much energy through the cue as you can. Um, and the second thing is it's harder to put English on the ball with a hard tip. So if you do happen to hit a little off center, it actually minimizes the English that you put on the cue, which can cause the cue ball to not go in the direction you're trying to go. Um, so like I said, those things are really, uh, you know, the main reasons for getting a separate brake cue. So if you want to invest in that, you know, it's, it is a worthwhile investment and it'll, you know, last quite a long time given the amount of times you break versus uh, the shots you're taking in a game. Um, so let's talk a little bit. Um, uh, one more thing I wanted to mention too. A lot of people ask me when they're breaking, should they look at the cue ball last or the object ball last? So traditionally when you're playing pool, you're taught to look at the object ball last. So if I have a shot like this, you know, when I get down, I'll take my warm up strokes or whatever. And then usually I'll exaggerate this. Usually when you look up, you know, you're looking at the object ball and you're stroking like this the whole time. Um, the break and the jump, coincidentally, that I'll talk about later, those are shots where even the pros a lot of times will focus on the cue ball instead of the object ball. Uh, I have seen a lot of the pros, they will, many of them do still look up at the rack and focus on the spot they're trying to hit and just assume that they're going to hit the cue ball where they want to hit it. But I also see a lot of the top pros focusing more on the cue ball. And it's generally because they feel like they're going to give a little better strike if they're looking where they're trying to hit with their tip as opposed to what the contact point they're trying to make. So personally, I, I tend to look at the cue ball more when I'm breaking. Um, either one is okay, um, but, I, but it is definitely, uh, it's definitely okay to do it either way. Uh, don't let anybody tell you like you have to do it one way or the other. I've seen top professionals do it both ways. So I'm gonna start off I think there might have been, I'm sorry, I had a lot of things I wanted to cover, and I think I have one more. I know there's one more thing in here. Oh, yeah. Um, I talked a little bit before about, um, you know, accuracy over power. The one thing I wanted to mention was you see people a lot of times when they break, they're down here like this and they do this like huge pumping motion with their arm and they throw their body into the break and they do all of that. Um, that's all great if it actually helps you hit the ball a little faster. In general, when I see people doing that kind of thing, usually they're just reducing their accuracy. So again, when you start out breaking, just try to make a nice smooth stroke, you know, take the, take the ball back. For instance, if I was gonna break, and I'll do this in a minute, when I start out, if I'm just aiming at that pocket for my break, I can just come back like this. I mean, that would be a reasonable break shot, you know, 15, 16, 17 miles an hour. You don't need to, I don't need to sit here and have a shot like this and go like, you know, like that and try to hit the ball. It's, the accuracy is going to be much different if you do that versus just making a nice smooth stroke. And the last thing I wanted to mention, and we'll go over some of these when I'm breaking too, is if you watch most pros, they actually take a little more time with their break shot than they do with their regular routine. So I see a lot of pros out there, they might, they might use three or four uh, warm-up strokes when they're playing. They might use eight or nine when they're breaking. So they're really, really dialing in and getting, getting their feet right, getting everything to feel right before they, um, before they shoot. Most amateurs, when I see them break, they do the opposite. They get up there and, you know, it looks like this and then they just go ahead and whack the ball. And they I mean, they barely even aimed at the ball. And um, so kind of work on, if you just take an extra couple of practice strokes when you're breaking, that alone will probably help your break get better. I'm gonna start out with the eight ball break. And again, just to give myself uh, a little excuse, <laughs> But uh, just for me personally with uh, some neck issues and shoulder issues, I really don't put a lot of practice time in my break. I probably practice it like an hour a month, which is not good for someone that plays at my level, but it's just kind of what I do. I, I, try to, I try to do it a little more here and there, but um, it's not really a lot. There we go. 
and and again if you're a you know intermediate or even lower advanced like league player i mean i think if you just when you practice a lot of people myself included we get lazy when we practice and like i play nine ball predominantly i'll grab the balls and i throw them out on the table and i run the patterns out and then i grab them and throw them out on the table and run the patterns out I simply just played the ghost where i'm breaking or if i broke 10 times or 20 times every time i practiced that alone is going to elevate my break quite a bit so you don't have to sit here and break for like an hour or two straight like the pros do but just put a little bit of time into it and you'll definitely see the results and i'm going to go over like kind of how to read the rack and how to see how to adjust your break so that you can make balls with the eight ball rack um there is there is not really there's there aren't any balls in the eight ball rack that are kind of wired to go into a pocket if anybody nine ball you'll see people make the corner ball all the time you'll see them make the one in the side if you're playing 10 ball you'll see certain balls want to go in certain pockets with the eight ball rack i cannot make any ball go in any pocket consistently uh, there are some things you can do to try to get the eight ball to go in the side that's about a one in 25 or one in 30 shot if you practice it uh, i've made it three times in a row before on a table sometimes the tables just there's little pits where the balls sit and sometimes things just kind of open up in such a way that the ball wants to track straight toward the side and we've all seen that in the bars or wherever but i can't make it happen i can't sit here today and like hit an eight ball break and say oh, the eight ball is going to go in that pocket i'd probably have to do it 20 30 40 times and then it it might go in there so the key with eight ball whether you're breaking from the front or the side is you just want to make a nice square hit on the ball and you want to leave the cue ball in the middle of the table. If you leave the cue ball somewhere in the middle of the table, you give yourself the best chance to have an open shot uh, once you make a ball. I see some people, they want to put follow on the ball. They want to drive into the stack twice. So the ball will come here and it'll come back and then it'll drive through again. Uh, I don't like that. Number one, a lot of times the cue ball sits way down here. And number two, you're kind of playing pinball with all the rest of the balls and there's too much of a chance for the cue ball to go in the pocket. I also see people overdraw the ball, and that's actually a little worse. Uh, and uh, if you end up hitting the ball and leaving the cue ball like all the way back up here, if you don't have a ball sitting right here, or right here, you're generally going to have a pretty tough shot for an opening shot. So, again, my goal is kind of a two foot circle, kind of like right here in the middle of the table to leave the cue ball. I'm going to start out just breaking a couple um, from where I usually break from. And I did hit one practice break this morning, so I'm 100% warmed up. So we'll see how this goes. Um, again, I generally, I don't know why. Um, I played with Thorsten Holman years ago. He's one of the best eight ball players on the planet, like ever. And he breaks probably 20% harder than I do. And I've watched him break sometimes and nothing goes in and it's amazing. You'd think like five balls should go in the way he breaks. And uh, I just kind of talked to him a little bit too. And for some reason, none of the top players really like breaking directly from the center. It kind of makes it work. But for some reason, if you break even just a little bit off center, like an inch or two, it, it just tends to... I don't know, do something different and, and transfer energy to the balls a little differently. I, I very rarely see anybody in a professional eight ball match breaking directly from the center. Um, what I personally do is I try to pick a couple spots to, to practice from. Uh, one spot I like is on a line from this diamond um, all the way into the rack. So if you break from up here in the table, um, it, you know, it would look something like this. I like to break off the rail, so I would put the ball, say, right there. Um, another spot that I like is like two inches off of this diamond. So again, I would I would kind of draw my line and do it like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and break from my first spot here and see how I do. So I'm gonna hit one um, kind of smooth, probably about 17 or 18 miles an hour. Okay, so that was just, again, Hit them pretty square, nothing went in, and that happens. I would, s I would, s go ahead. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of balls, and 
you're hitting one ball and you're hitting like a stop shot from that distance and that speed you'd probably hit a little below center there are 15 balls they're kind of pushing back on that cue ball so generally center to a little below center is where I'm trying to hit and I don't really ever break eight ball like that that's a little softer than I would like to break but I did try to hit them solid I try to get the cue ball to either come straight back to the center or I try to get it to come over to the side of the table and back out to the center so as long as I get that um, that's okay The other thing to be aware of, especially if you're playing, thank you, uh, especially if you're playing out in various pool halls, bars, whatever, unless the cloth is brand new, it's much harder to make a ball on the break than when the table's new. Uh, there's little pits that develop underneath these balls, and over time, the spot gets a little pit in it, the balls get little pits in them, and I bet you if I looked closely at this rack, there's probably, there's a gap right there. So there's going to be like little gaps in between these balls. There's one right there. So all of that dissipates the energy when you, when you break the rack. Uh, even if your opponent's racking for you and they give you a nice tight rack, it's just harder to make balls uh, once the table is broken in a little bit. Okay, I'm going to hit this one just a little harder. Okay, so a little bit low on the cue ball, it kind of drifted back. I got a little fortunate that I have some balls up here I can kind of shoot. I also have like the one I can shoot or the seven. Um, but not bad, I hit them pretty square. I have a little cluster here. But again, I'm, my goal was to try to get the ball to stop here. By the way, you'll hear the speed on the break. There is a an app. Um, Predator actually sponsors it now, so I think it's called the Predator Break Speed app. It's changed changed names a little bit over the years, but if you just search for Break uh, Break Speed or Predator Break Speed, you should find it. It's actually pretty accurate. You basically uh, tell it what size table you're breaking on and where your cue ball is on the line, and it will listen. You put your phone down on the rail. And it will listen for the contact of the cue ball and listen for the next noise it hears, which is you hitting the rack. And it estimates the distance and figures out the speed. And it's they've measured it against a speed gun, and it's pretty accurate. And I think the app's like $5. So um, if nothing else, it's kind of a nice curiosity um, to find out how fast you break. To give you an idea, like a soft cut type break, probably in the 14, 15 mile an hour range. Um, that first break I hit was probably like 17, 18. The one I just hit now was probably like in the 20, 21 range. Uh, the top professional, I think the top break they ever recorded was something like 35 miles an hour. And uh, Mike, Desha Mike DeShane hit one where he hit the ball so hard it actually went straight up in the air probably about eight feet. I mean, it was ridiculous. But if you want to watch like somebody really break, he's passed away now. But Tony Ellen, if you look him up on YouTube, he was a... Uh, a larger guy, really nice guy, great player back in the like the 90s. And um, he has a break on YouTube if you look. He breaks from here playing nine ball. And he just, I mean, he launches every bit of everything he had into the balls. And I've never seen anybody. He hit it, and the ball just stopped right there. There was no spin on the cue ball. There was nothing. He hit him as hard as I've ever seen anybody hit a ball. And the ball just sat like, like he just placed it there. It was crazy. If I did that, all of you would be in danger over there. So <laughs> it was it was really interesting. And Jeff DeLuna's got a great break. Uh, Francisco Bustamante, uh, Shane's got a really good break. So there's a lot of people out there you can watch. And there's actually a lot of good break tutorials on YouTube too. If you uh, if you're interested in in uh, kind of looking at some of the uh, theory behind some of the different movements. So I'm going to try to hit this one kind of the way I, I would in a match. And again, I, I usually try about 70, 80%. I never try to, to go full out. So that's usually what happens to me. But so you can see, I kind of, the cue ball did bounce around a little bit, but, um, and again, I did. Once, once you break a couple of times and you practice it a couple of times, you kind of get dialed into the, the body motion and the, uh, if you're using that and the tip position and all of that. But like I said, when I play eight ball, there's, 
I'll do one more of these. Um, there's really, there's not much, not much you can do as far as predicting that uh, you make balls. Having a really tight rack helps, and you're almost never going to get that. Um, so you just have to kind of hit them square and hope for the best. So what I do personally, also if you shoot with a little more of an open stance, um, when you break, it's good to kind of close your stance up a little bit and kind of get your feet kind of more like this so that you're in a more like athletic type stance just so that you can, you're a little more balanced. And what I do personally is I try to look at my line and then I try to get down very, very close on that line and I, I get my tip position first and then I look up and then I take a couple practice strokes, a couple more than I usually do and then just kind of sit there and dial in. So again, that's not too bad. Cue ball came a little closer to the side pocket than I would like it, but that's not bad. That's a pretty runnable rack from right there. So. Scott, in eight ball, what percentage of the breaks do you, do you typically make a ball, and what percent would an average player make a ball? Honestly, for eight ball, if you can hit the balls fairly square, I don't think there's a big difference in percentage of making a ball. I've seen some people in league, because I still I still play in a, an AP leg, uh, sorry APA league, and uh, I see people hit some pretty horrible breaks, honestly, and they make a ball. It, it's I, I could hit the ball off the side of the ball and go bouncing all around, and a ball will drift in. Like I said, it's all about the collisions. For me, if I'm playing good and breaking well. I would say I would expect to make a ball probably 60 to 70 percent of the time. Uh, and but there's days where I've just hit the heck out of the rack and it seems like all four or five breaks I have just nothing goes in. And at my level if I'm playing somebody that plays like me it's that's really bad. But it happens. All I can do is try to hit him as good as I can hit him solid and just try to get that cue ball give me a good position. So here, here's, sorry, oh, so here's a second ball, <laughs> so here's a second ball break. Me personally, I'd rather hit them from the front on a nine foot table. If I play on a bar table, which I very rarely do, uh, a lot of times I will try the second ball break, especially if the rules are such that the eight ball break counts on the break. Sometimes when you're playing, the eight ball does not count on the break, it just gets spotted up. So to me, there's no advantage to breaking from this side if the eight ball doesn't count. Um, for me, if you hit these balls a little off or you get a bad rack, a lot, all these balls could end up on this half of the table. I've seen it happen a lot. So I'd much rather take my chances and try to spread the ball out. If you do try the second ball break, do not hit it as hard as you can. Because again, cue ball is bouncing on the way to the rack. So if it's bouncing and it hits this six ball in midair, it is going to go that way and fly off the table. So I hit these probably 10 or 20 percent slower than I would my normal break to try to control the cue ball. Your goal is to hit the second ball as full as you can without clipping the front ball and then put some draw on the ball so that basically the cue ball will come over to this rail and draw back out toward the center of the table. You don't need to use any kind of inside or outside English. That's just going to make the hit that much more difficult to estimate when you're this far away and you're trying to put that much English on it. Okay, so you can see a lot of balls on that side of the table. Now I did make a ball and it actually looks like I could run this out pretty easy. But sometimes, you know, it looks more like that, and then it's not quite so easy. So I'll try one more of those. Yeah, it does get the eight ball moving. Cert I have made the eight ball breaking from the front, but it, when, when it happens, it's so rare, and I, I almost like, oh, I didn't even see it go in. When I'm breaking from this side, I can usually get the eight ball moving at least one out of every three or four racks. And sometimes it'll move this way and a ball will hit it from here and it'll send it up in the corner. Um, 
So again, if I'm, I don't know, I used to break that way all the time when I was younger for years and I just kind of shifted away from it and started watching more like professional matches and getting better and I started breaking more from the front. Like I'm playing in the US Amateur next weekend and it's a combination of eight and nine ball. So it's very important to play eight ball just as well as you're playing nine ball. And some of the guys that I end up playing against are eight ball specialists from around the country. So uh, you, you have to really, you can't just take eight ball for granted and say, oh, I can't wait till I get to nine ball. You have to play both. So if I break from up here a couple of times and either my timing's off or the balls aren't going in, I'll, I'll switch over to this just to change it up. Let me try one more. And again, I'm aiming pretty low, probably a full tip below center. So you can see you get a couple secondary collisions sometimes with the cue ball going into the stack and it can kind of pop the eight out, but you know. So any questions on the eight ball break? Yeah, so the well, well, I guess my point is I, I try to use as little or no English as possible on the cue ball when I'm striking. Yeah, you generally center. yeah, generally when you're hitting eight ball, you don't want to use English on the ball. It's not going to help make any kind of the balls uh, go in any certain way. And if you can hit a, if you can make a more square hit on the front ball by by hitting directly down the center, then go ahead and do that. Or square off I come off the yeah. I, I hit square from whatever angle I'm shooting at, right? So if I have the cue ball here, I am on a direct line into that ball from here. If I'm here, I'm at a direct line into that ball. And then based on how hard you hit uh, would determine what kind of, you know, how low you have to hit on the ball. Anywhere from a little below center to maybe a half a tip or whatever below center. So I'm going to use a magic rack for nine ball just to make sure all the balls are tight. Um, again, if anybody watches a bunch of matches on YouTube, most of the tournaments these days are using some sort of template rack. Uh, this is the magic rack. They sell them here. They have a couple other varieties here as well. What it does is it kind of leans the balls into each other a little bit and it makes sure that every rack, all the balls are completely tight. Again, if I use a regular rack, I'm not going to get necessarily some of the balls to go the way they're supposed to go. Uh, in nine ball and that is more reality so when I practice I use these sometimes but most of the tournaments that I play people are still using the regular rack because usually we play winter breaks and if you use this magic rack I can run like a ridiculous amount of racks because I can control everything um, usually when you see people use the template racks they're playing alternate break format so it's almost like tennis you get a chance to get up and break a perfect rack and control everything and run out and then the next guy gets a chance to come up and do the same thing but if you use this template rack in a winter breaks format, it's, uh, it's not good for the opponent usually, if you're playing good anyways. So with the nine ball rack, um, most people you'll see breaking from the side. You very rarely see people break from the middle unless there's a break box or something that they're forced to break in. Does anybody know why people are breaking from the side? No takers? <laughs> Um, sorry? No, it's a good guess, though. That's a very good <laughs> guess. I know that's how I started. I said, well, everyone breaks from the side. That's what I'm doing. And this table is fairly new still, but usually there's a line running from that spot to the one ball because people are playing nine ball. There's one on that table over there you can see. So the reason why is if you look, people are trying to make the wing ball or the corner ball. So if I'm breaking from this side of the table, which is where most right-handers break from, I'm trying to make this six ball in the corner pocket. And if you look at the tangent line between the balls, that six ball is actually pointed to come right about here. 
So again, at the tangent line, I look right down that line, that six ball should come off the five ball and land right here on the rail. So the reason it goes in the pocket is because there's a little L in the rack, and it would be the one, the eight, the nine, and the five. And by hitting from the side, what I'm basically doing is I'm causing that L to move a little faster than these two balls. And so what happens is it pushes everything down just enough so that the tangent line kind of turns and then the six goes in the corner. If there's a gap between these two balls or these two balls, it makes that process a whole lot easier. So you always hear about the rack mechanics are doing funny thin stuff with their fingers, you know. Um, I don't think there's that much of that going on right now, but back in the day there was. And uh, also if I tilt the rack, if I tilt it a little bit this way, it turns that tangent line down. It just, I can make that ball all day long. So if I can make that ball, now I can control my cue ball, the one ball. I can get the one ball to hit off this side rail and land right there. I can get my cue ball to land right here, and I got a good first shot like every single time. I've watched Shane Van Boning do it in a match. I've watched the Coe brothers do it uh, eight, nine, ten times in a row where their opening shot, the cue ball's right here and the one ball's like right here. I mean, they just run out every time. So I'm not a big rack inspector. I don't play for a lot of money. I have a job. I don't, you know, I'm not trying to <laughs> take anybody's life savings when I'm playing pool. I mean, I do like to win, but unless I suspect somebody of really doing something really bad, I just kind of go up there and take whatever I get. I've broken bad racks before and made five balls on the break, and I've broken perfect racks and made nothing. So I, I don't buy into all of that but again if I was at a professional level it might be a little different but you'll see people down here like this checking for little gaps between all the balls and then they'll rack the balls for five minutes my back hurts if I do that so but it is good sometimes to just take a quick peek for instance if I see a gap over here or one over here I may choose which side I'm breaking from because if there's a gap over here I'm gonna break from that side if there's a little gap over here I might break from that side but generally I just expect the balls to be somewhat tight I mean, really, if they're pretty tight and I break from the side, I should be able to make that six ball in the corner pocket. You'll sometimes see the players make the one go in the side. Again, that tangent line between the one and the eight is a little bit off. But if I put a little spin on the cue ball, it can put a little spin on the one. It can kind of maneuver things a little bit, and the one might go in the side. But really, your best chance of breaking and running out in nine ball is to make the corner ball and play position on the one. So I'm going to start out just hitting kind of a, again, kind of a medium speed break, trying to make the six in the corner. What are you uh, so I'm, in this particular case, I'm just going to try to hit the one ball pretty full. There is like a cut break you can do, and that would be where you hit the one ball maybe seven eighths or three quarters full. And you put a little draw on the cue ball and come over to the rail and come out like this. Uh, I'll, I'll try one or two of those as well. Generally, the cut, the cut break is used when you're forced to break from inside the box, which is right here and you can't get over to the side far enough so by cutting the ball you're simulating the cue ball coming from this direction that's why usually they um, do that so again i should not have to even hit these hard i'm just going to hit like actually pretty easy okay so you can see i didn't hit them hard at all uh it's hard to do that with a regular rack but with a magic rack you know all the balls are touching so you're going to get that good energy uh, transfer so I have a pretty decent shot on the one, and again, if I can get shape on the two, it's, you know, it's not too bad. But you can see that six ball, that tangent line altered, and that six went straight into the corner pocket. So if you make the six on the break at your level, are you pretty sure that you're going to run that single? No, not every time, no. Oh. It helps, though. <laughs> <laughs> For me, from my... I mean, at a pro level, that's another misnomer, and I talked about this a little bit in one of my other clinics. Typically, when we're watching matches on YouTube, which it's great that we have that now, we don't have to rely on ESPN, which stopped showing matches a long time ago. Um, you're seeing players that are dialed into the tables. They've been there all week. They're in the quarterfinals, semifinals, finals, and they're also usually the top players in the world. Even at that level, when they do statistics for a, a random tournament, the break and runout percentage for a pro is anywhere from like 20 to 35 percent, maybe 40 percent on a real if they're playing a real easy equipment. Um, that's with new ball, you know, new tables, uh, clean balls, good conditions. 
at the most I've ever seen it is like 38% for a tournament. Now again, you're wrapping the good players with the players that went out the first round or two as well. So there's this myth, I think, that I've even heard some of my students come to me, maybe a guy I'm working with for the first time, and he'll be like, oh yeah, I ran six racks the other night. I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> you know, you didn't. <laughs> um, so if, if I have, I do drills a lot with different numbers of balls. So if I put four balls on the table, just throw them out randomly, and this is a drill I, I talk about, and take ball in hand, I will run them out perfectly, like no hard shots, no anything, probably about 18 out of 20 times. If I put five balls in the mix, I'm usually around 15, 16. When I put six balls out there, I'm like 12. Now again, to shoot any bank shots or any tough shots, that's staying perfectly in line the whole time with reasonable shots. So if I took the couple of tough shots here and there, it might, you know, it might be a little higher. But now you go to seven or eight, now you're at 10, eight, you know, for me. So, but if I'm breaking and I can reliably make that corner ball and get shape on the one, I mean, I feel like I could run out, you know, honestly, like 15, 20% of the time, 25% of the time, somewhere like that. Some days it feels like you run out all the time. But again, when you're being honest with yourself, it's kind of like when I play golf, everybody hits a 300 yard drive until, until you actually play golf with them and you realize they don't. But um, yeah, I try to not focus on like what, how I am on my best day. It's really how do I play my average day. And I know for me, for average, if I'm playing a set with somebody and I'm playing a race to seven, if I win seven games, I, I feel like I should break and run out two of those seven. So that's about, you know, 20, 25 percent, give somewhere in there. Some days it's more. I mean, I've broken, ran five or six racks before in a row, but that's, you know, that here and there, it's not expected at all. And the pros don't do that either. It's really more about making good decisions. If you don't have a shot, play in a good safe, you know, things like that. All right, I'm going to try again, just kind of a nice, easy break again. And you'll see I don't have to hit them super hard. Just pay attention to that hit. Okay. So if you're practicing and you see this, you either have to hit them harder so the one ball comes off this back rail and comes over here, or you have to hit them softer so the one stays over here. So it's really important if you're really practicing uh, your break to kind of read the rack and see where everything went and and pay attention to that because this while I could play a good safe from here that's not a good opening shot yeah I don't that is okay so the question was putting the two ball in the back of the rack is preferential now, do you mean way in the back or the back two spots? Yeah. So that's possible. Uh, again, I would highly recommend if anybody's interested, I learned a lot of what I know from watching and practicing over the years, but Joe Tucker is a phenomenal teacher, a friend of mine. He has got a lot of free content on YouTube and he's got a lot of paid content as well. He has a book and some DVDs called Racking Secrets. He goes into great detail about the expectations how to pattern rack, how to pattern rack for your opponent, what gaps do what, different break styles. I mean, it's a lot of good information. And it's not, I mean, it's like 30 or 40 bucks or something for one of the DVDs. He's got a ton of information in there. Um, yes, if the two balls in the back, it can, it generally is going to want to bank up table. Uh, a lot of tournaments I play in, they force us to put the two ball uh, behind the nine. So something like this. It has to go in one of these two spots. And what that does, if you're racking the one ball on the spot, is the two ball tends to come over here and stay down here on the bottom of the table. And the one ball goes up table. So it tends to make that first transition a little more difficult. And it also makes it a little more fair and keeps people from pattern racking and doing things like that. If I use a magic rack and I pattern rack, I can run out, it just feels like almost every time. I mean, I miss a ball here and there, but you know, the, the balls just spread in the optimal, optimal way. Okay, now I'm gonna break just a little harder. And sometimes breaking harder in nine ball, again, if I'm not using a magic rack, I'm gonna hit them a little harder because I have a feeling there'll be a few more gaps, but breaking harder is not necessarily better to try to, to, try to get that corner ball. I could actually maybe hit them so hard that that transfer doesn't take place and, and I don't make the ball. But this is probably how I typically would break uh, when I'm playing in a nine ball match.
So, pretty good result. Lost the cue ball a little bit, but uh, I would be very happy with that if the cue ball was like kind of in this area, but I'm still kind of happy with that, so. But again, that's not the goal. There's no way I can predict making three or four balls on the break. It just, if it happens, it happens. My goal is to try to make the corner ball and get the cue ball in the middle of the table. I had a day, it's been quite a while, before I had some of my neck and uh, back issues for sure, but I had a day probably six, seven years ago, I was playing in a tournament. I broke the best I've ever broke. I made four balls, five balls on the break, like all day long. Three balls, two balls. I mean, if I didn't make three balls, I thought I was doing something wrong. It was the craziest day. I don't remember hardly any dry breaks. I had cue ball position. I just couldn't, couldn't miss. And, uh, you know, when you practice like I do, I just figured, oh, I finally figured everything out, like the timing, the tip position, everything's perfect, right? So two days go by, and I go up to the same pool hall, and I'm practicing. I don't warm up. I don't like try to ease my way into it. I'm just like, man, I'm going to see if I can get a couple extra miles an hour on that. I was breaking so good. I put the cue ball here like this. I sit down like this. And man, I came back and I straight under the ball, hit it probably to where like <laughs> Evelyn's sitting over there. I launched it like 30, 40 feet of the air. I looked out at the table to make sure I didn't rip the cloth. And the owner's walking right by. And he goes, nice nine iron. <laughs> I mean, it, so I, I calmed it down after that and just went back to my normal breaking. I can't explain what I did that day. It was just, I don't know, has not been repeated since. One other thing, too, I think I forgot to mention earlier. I choke up a little bit on my break. Um, if you're hitting the balls like normal speed, use your regular stance, your regular hand position. But if you're going to kind of introduce a little uh, body movement, for me, I stand a little bit taller. I don't want to get down like this because it restricts movement. Um, and when you're shooting normally, you don't need to shoot really hard usually. So I stand a little taller. And then to compensate for that, I choke up probably about a hand width, like three or four inches uh, forward. So my normal position would be here. And since I have this wrap on my cue, I can easily see where my hand should be. And I actually look down every time before I break to make sure my hand is right on that spot that I've predetermined. I can probably feel it anyways, but since you're building a habit to hold the cue at like a 90 degree angle, my tendency is to start kind of floating back a little bit if I don't look down and put my hand right there. So you can put a little piece of tape on your stake if you don't have a wrap like that or little markings, but it helps. And for me on this, I'm about three quarters of a tip down, about halfway between the center and the bottom of the ball. Okay, so a little spin on that, but again, a little bit lost control of the cue ball, but you can see though that ball's going in the corner like every time. So when I get warmed up and I'm hitting pretty good, you, usually I'm pretty good about getting the ball to, to just kind of bounce back and, and land kind of in the middle. But again, if that timing gets off and I feel like I'm losing control of the cue ball, I just back off a little bit until I get my timing back again and then go from there. I could sit here and do this all day, but uh, you kind of get the point. And, and again, if, if sometimes the corner ball, if the corner ball's not going, pay attention to it. So if I have, I didn't have one happen yet. Let me, here, let me use a regular rack. I'll do one more I can show you where this may or may not go, depending on, I won't, uh, I won't try to get them super tight. One other note too, a lot of times there's a little divot in the spot and people tend to rack the balls above the spot. If you rack them above the spot, that's okay, but just realize your tangent line is now moving farther away from the pocket. So it's gonna be that much harder to make the corner ball. You are allowed to rack anywhere on the spot. Generally, people try to get it right on the center dot. But if you have a choice between racking a little above and a little below, try to rack them just a little below. It, it'll help actually help that corner ball go in uh, in nine ball. Okay, so there's. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I I honestly I've, I'm just an honest person. I've I've never purposely given anybody a bad rack. I've probably unintentionally done that by not paying attention. But I always try to rack for my opponent the same way I rack for myself and. That way it's all, you know, do it as best as I can. So go ahead and watch the, <laughs> what? Sure to call it out. I know, no, no. Oh, I 
kind of come through the ball, but at no point in time am I trying to like squeeze my cue. If you have any tension in your arm, it just slows the acceleration of the cue down. So uh, you'll see some players when they break, uh, Johnny Archer does this, he actually follows through like that. He's just letting his whole arm go. And, but all of that's not doing anything. Really, as long as you are accelerating at the moment of impact, however long you follow through, whether it's four inches or eight or 10 or go like that, it, the cue ball's already gone. But it is good though to keep, I don't loosen my grip any more than I do when I'm normally shooting, but I also don't tighten it at all either. I just try to keep it relaxed and then you get a natural wrist snap. When you come back like this and you start moving forward, your wrist naturally wants to snap into it. And if you can time all that, you can hit the cue ball at the peak of acceleration, which gets you a little bit extra power. So pay attention to the six ball if it doesn't go in and see where it hits. Okay, of course it went in. Yeah, see, so, yeah, so, so far I'm losing the cue ball a little bit today, but like I said, if I was playing in a match, I'd work on that a little bit and try to, maybe my tip position's a little low, so I'd just go up a little higher, which would keep it more in the center. So, since the table is cooperating today, I'll just show you or tell you. So if that corner ball is hitting high, generally that means that you want to go a little more to the side. Um, the more you break from the side, the lower that tangent line is going to go down. If it's hitting a little low, then you want to move back toward the middle of the table a little bit because that means you're moving the tangent line a little too far. So if you go back to the middle, it'll actually pull it back in that way. Yes. Occasionally. Um, very hard to do on worn in tables and regular racks. So the question was if I've ever used the soft break uh, Corey Dual style. He's definitely one of the innovators of breaking. He actually caused quite a uh, commotion, I think, years ago at one of the tournaments when he did it on Earl Strickland. It was the wrong person to do it on, I think. And uh, I was at that tournament, coincidentally, and uh, Earl was fuming. Corey was breaking like 12 miles an hour and making the ball and just running out and and it was driving them bananas so of course now they have some rules where t three balls you have to make three balls or three balls have to go past the, you know the head strain or whatever that you see that a lot in the Moscone Cup and some of these world tournaments kind of forces everybody to break firmly I would say the game just like any other uh, sport has gone through a lot of uh, changes over the years due to technology and, and uh, just more knowledge and things like that. So it used to be everyone just hit the balls as hard as they could and try and hope for uh, the best. And now it's like very surgical about how they're hitting and what kind of spin they're putting and all of that. So the soft break is great if, again, you have a magic rack or at least very tight rack and, and a new table. I watched, uh, I think it's on YouTube still, Dennis Orculio think he was playing the 10 ball ghost and breaking super soft and just all the balls would stay on this half of the table and he just pop them in like it was nothing and go on to the next rack so I'm only going to talk for a few minutes about the 10 ball break it's not quite as prevalent I don't think at the amateur level um, uh, but it's still important to know so like when I'm playing 10 ball there's actually quite a few balls in this rack that are wired to go so the one ball tends to go in the side pocket. These back two balls, sorry, wrong rack. The back two balls tend to go in the side pockets. The one ball tends to go up table. So if you can get your cue ball off the rail and back up table, then you can get a uh, position on the one ball. These back corner balls actually tend to go four rails around the table. And if they don't hit anything, a uh, surprisingly amount of time, they'll go four rails around the table and land back in these pockets. And these back two balls, tend to bank one rail up toward the corners. So if you watch Shane, who's one of the best 10 ball breakers in the world, uh, the Co brothers also have phenomenal 10 ball breaks, you will see one or more of those balls tracking very consistently. It's not unusual for them to make two or three balls on the break in 10 ball. And then they're essentially playing seven ball, which makes it much easier. Um, I know for me, I can beat the nine ball ghost all day long, but if I'm playing the 10 ball ghost, a lot of that has to do with how well I'm breaking. It's very easy to end up with clusters if you're not making balls on the break, now you've got to run all 10 balls. It's it just, it's much more difficult to beat the 10 ball ghost because of that. 
My preferred spot from here, I have two of them. One is again about an inch off of this diamond and the other one is kind of halfway. So I would just pick one of those two spots usually. You generally don't break 10 ball from the side. Although I have seen a few players do it and do it pretty successfully. Again, same thing, trying to hit a full hit on the ball. And that's exactly what I want. I want the cue ball to come back and hit this rail and pop out and kind of in the center of the table. So that's pretty good result right there. Be pretty happy with that. So again, I try to cover these topics like in an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Pretty much every topic I've taught so far, I could sit here for three or four hours and talk about, but I have a couple other things I want to go over. So any questions on the breaking? And I'm going to be here for a few hours today, so especially for anybody that's new, come up to me, introduce yourself. I'm here to help. I'll help you with any fundamental question you have. You want to learn how to do a certain shot. doesn't have to be anything about this lesson. Just come up and, uh, you know, we can go over some more of this or, or something else. Now I'm going to talk about some things that will make all the room owners cringe. Yeah. Cringe. But if you're hitting at an eight foot table, it's important to know. Instead of a nine foot table, if you're playing on an eight foot table, is it everything you said applies? Yeah, so the question was on different size tables, and someone else asked it before too about a seven foot table. The tables are two by one, they're the same ratio. So um, there's some subtle things you can do differently on a bar table or a smaller table, but ultimately it's the same same technique. All right, so again, a little caveat. I've got a really bad shoulder from playing tennis when I was younger. Uh, I never did get it fixed, so I just kind of deal with it. So I do not practice my jump shots, but I'm okay at them. I'm better than the average bear, so to speak, but <laughs> I don't sit here for an hour a day, practice jump shots. I, I'm very good at kicking. I prefer to kick, but I do jump well enough to get myself out of, out of trouble. So there are better people in town that jump better than me, but again, I should be able to at least I would highly advocate my disclaimer, don't go to a pool room and sit here and just hit jump shots for an hour. Someone's gonna come over and probably get upset with you. It really doesn't cause any damage if done properly, but every single time you hit down on the ball, it does create a little burn mark in the cloth, especially if it's Simonis. Uh, there is a way around it. You can get a little patch of Simonis from somewhere and put it underneath the ball, which kind of cushions it a little bit. And then when you hit down on the ball, it will it will prevent that little mark from being caused. And that's a, that's a good way to practice repetitively. But um, I'll sneak a few in here and there, you know, and it's not bad. But again, if, if all the room owner hears is bam, 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 over and over, someone's probably gonna come over. So either that or go like really early when no one's, you know, no one's there. But but like with anything, whether it's a mass A shot, a jump shot, a break shot, whatever, you have to practice to get good. You're not gonna be able to watch a video and just start magically jumping the ball. And a lot of people have trouble with this, so. The main thing with jumping is it's illegal to scoop under the ball. It has been for a long time. I still see people sometimes randomly in bars trying to do it where they, you know, they have a jump shot and they're down like this and they, you know, do that kind of shot. That is completely illegal. Um, so I think the Sammy Jones was one of the early inventors of the jump cue and it's gone through a lot of different iterations. I happen to have a carbon fiber one that I just picked up a couple weeks ago from my buddy in Europe, uh, Goran. It's from Go Customs. It jumps so far better than all my other custom jump cues that I've had made. And uh, I really like it, so we'll see as time goes on. But jumping is more about technique than the actual cue. Um, I have three or four, like three $400 jump cues. I can go over there and grab a $50 one and jump like pretty much the same. It's all about getting comfortable with what you know what you have. The main thing what I see people do when they're jumping is they they kind of stand too tall and they try to shoot it like a regular like a regular shot. So people will kind of have their arm out like this and they look really uncomfortable and their neck it hurts me just to watch them. And uh, usually what happens is they trap the ball or they miscue. You have to get you still want your arm in kind of a 90 degree position, but you have to get closer to the ball. So the best way to do it is to line up like a normal shot, get your hand about you know four or five inches away, and just kind of raise up, and as you raise up, collapse your arm down so that your forearm is almost even with the table. That gets your face 
and your whole body sort of angled down toward the shot. You don't want to stand super tall like that. So if I get down like this, you can see my, my arm is even with the table and my head is actually like down closer to the cue ball. I don't want to be shooting it like that. It puts a lot of strain on everything. Most people, and I've seen a lot of pros do this, it's difficult to aim the shot when you're standing up. Usually you're standing a little sideways, you're standing a little closer, your, your perception is skewed. So a lot of people will aim like this down here and then kind of get up like that. Another good thing to do is when you are aiming, if I'm trying to hit that pocket, let's say, try to pick a spot on the cloth, like a little mark. Try to pick a spot on the object ball that you can aim at so you don't even have to look up that way anymore. For me, it's very difficult to, to kind of draw that line back and forth of what I'm trying to aim at. I just, and you also don't want a lot of movement. You don't want to be hitting a jump shot and be going like that when you're shooting. You don't want your shoulder to drop. You don't want your head to move. So if I can pick a spot like right there and just get down like this and look at that spot, then I can aim properly and I don't have to worry about what's up there anymore. I've already looked at that when I'm standing up. You don't have to hit it super hard. It's more of a, like a kind of a, you don't have to also like snap your wrist or do anything crazy. It's just like a very short kind of popping motion. You do want to follow through. Your tip is going to hit the cloth most likely, but it's going to kind of just bounce off. It's not going to do any damage. It's not like a Massé shot where you see people like driving down on it or whatever. Um, so again, for me, I would start out practicing maybe about a foot away from the ball. And the best way to do this to learn is to just, you know, practice hitting it toward the pocket. You don't have to worry about hitting another ball. You're still aiming at something. And just try it from like a foot away. And um, so one technique would be kind of being up like this. So that would look like this. I'm here. I aim. Again, collapse everything. You make a nice elevated bridge. I can help you with that if anybody has problems with that. But generally, you want to just put your thumb next to your finger and spread your fingers out and try to get as high as you can. Taller people or people with longer fingers, it's a little bit easier. But I, I have just average hands. I can definitely do that with no problem. So again, I'd start like this. Turn a little sideways, you'll see and just get up. Now when you're aiming, you have to look at center ball from the angle your cue is at, okay? So I can shoot a jump shot like this, like this, like this, like this. Whatever angle my stick is at, I have to look down, kind of visualize that angle, and that's where center ball is. And I wanna strike just below center ball. If you go above that mark, you're gonna trap the ball. I'll see if I can do it. So there's center as I'm looking down. If I hit up here, okay, it didn't jump because I was too high. And if you go too low, you're probably going to glance off the ball and miscue. So it might be hard to see on the camera, but if I'm, if I'm shooting a jump shot, so if I'm at this angle, that would be center ball. So I'm hitting just below that. So if you like use a stripe ball, where the rain is around the number, just aim like at the rain underneath the number would be a good spot to aim. Now, if I was aiming less of a jump shot like this, that's center, I'm just going to come down a little bit below. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Like this. You can also try to cheat and practice off the rail. It's a little easier to kind of mount your you know, bridge on top of that. It gets you another extra inch and a half or so of elevation. So like from here, okay, so that one I was a little bit, a little bit too high on the cue ball because I wasn't elevated as much. Okay, so this little short motion like that. That is one way to do it. Another way to do it is kind of a sidearm mode. I don't do this quite as much, but I see a lot of players do this. It does allow you to aim the shot a little bit easier. So they'll actually come completely sideways and, and hit it more like that. I don't do it that way quite as much, but it, it's very effective if you can do that. And the other way of doing it is the dart method, which I also don't do very much, but occasionally it comes up where that's kind of your only shot you have. And um, so you can like you're throwing a dart. And again, all you want to do is just have a short 
motion all with your wrist. You're not trying to move your whole shoulder or anything. And okay, um, so that would be the other method of doing it. Uh, there's one guy in town, one of my buddies, Kevin, who's probably the mm -hmm. best dart jumper for sure in town, maybe in the whole state of Florida. He's phenomenal at it, and we always joke around. I'll play safe and leave him like this, and the ball he's trying to hit is here, and I'm just sitting in my chair like, yep, he's going to make it. You know, it just it's, it's amazing. But I don't ever practice these. I'm not even super confident with these. But if I was this close, my preference is going to be to try to kick at the ball. But if you get good at this, and again, I'm, I'm not very, so we'll try this. Oh. Another thing, sorry, that was not going to work anyways. So I have a three-piece jump cue. Most jump cues are that long. If you have this extra piece on there, it weighs like almost twice as much. So it's much harder for the cue to get out of the way for you to jump properly. So what I just tried was never going to work anyways. If you get closer to the ball and you do have a three-piece jump cue, you want to take that back piece off. The back piece, leaving it on is for longer jumps where you're kind of at a more shallow angle, the higher you want to go and the quicker you want to go, you need less weight. People used to actually jump with just their shaft, which is illegal now, but uh, there's some trick shots where you can put a credit card between the balls and jump over the ball, and it's, it's a little bit of a foul technically, but they always allowed it in games, and it was always kind of a fun trick shot kind of thing to see. So let me try this one more time. Yeah, jump over the whole thing, so... And like I said, if I spent, like with anything I do or have done in the past, if I spent five or ten minutes a day practicing this over the course of a couple of days, couple of weeks, couple of months, you'd get, you know, pretty good feel for it. Uh, at, for me personally, I just don't shoot it enough to worry about it. So, like I said, if I was in a pinch and there were balls here and there were balls here and I felt like that was my best percentage play, I would try it. And I can do it well enough to at least try it but I don't ever expect to do anything phenomenal with it. Now if I have a, a shorter jump, you know, if someone leaves me something like this, I do feel like I'm a favorite to make the ball, especially when it's that close to the pocket. And the kick shot is much more difficult trying to come this way than judge that or come around the table. It's much more difficult to make the ball. So this would, be, this would be one area where I would, um, you know, pull the jump cue out. Let's see if I can do this. So again, you see it gets closer to the ball, my, ha my hand comes down, and I'm just going to pop it. I don't need to hit it super hard. Oops. Foul. <laughs> this thing jumps pretty well, but I'm still getting used to the angles I need. So a little too hard. So again, it's all a balance of speed, right? I had one last night. I just got this, like I said, a week ago, and I had one last night, and I had a very short jump like that, and I always have a little anxiety trying to make sure I clear the ball, and I actually jumped over that ball and the object ball I was trying to hit. So I, again, it just every jump cue is going to play a little different. Let me try one more. There, so... And again, if I did that over and over and over, probably get pretty good at it, but I don't. So, um, any questions on the jump shot? I was going, I don't know if you mentioned this when you started off on this, but from what I read is that, I mean, you actually rarely are you actually hit a jump when you get over the whole ball. You know, like if you're on the side. Good point. Hop, yeah. Little, to clear one ball, you get yep. Down. Good point. So the question was, a lot of times you don't even have to get over the whole ball, you're just trying to get over part of the ball, which makes the jump that much easier. So, matter of fact, if I have a jump shot like down here, and I've got, say, you know, half a ball or something to get over, I might just use my brake cue. Because the brake cue's got a hard enough tip on it, it's gonna get up over that half a ball, and I can actually make that ball and even draw it all the way back down the table if I, if I have to. Now, that's very difficult, but I've done it before, and sometimes even accidentally. And uh, so, you know, you get more control with the longer cue, uh, and like this cue, too. I would use all three pieces, and I wouldn't have to elevate very much at all uh, to get over that 
you know, to get over that little bit of the ball. So, um, <laughs> what else was I going to cover? Can you do the jump with a regular stick? Thank you. That was actually what I was going to cover. So, <laughs> with the modern, with the modern low deflection cues, it doesn't matter if it's carbon fiber shaft or the wood shaft or whatever, but they are hollow. This is actually filled with foam all the way down. So there's not a lot of mass at the front end. So if you try a masse shot or a jump shot with a low deflection shaft, it's doable, but it is much more difficult than the shafts from 20 years ago. Uh, Earl Strickland back in the day was one of the best full cue jumpers I ever saw. He used to hate the jump cue, now he has one. Uh, but he it is very difficult. Now if I have, again, a shot down here somewhere and I'm like just barely like an eighth of the ball or a quarter of the ball I if I can I'm gonna go grab my break cue but I do play some tournaments and situations where jump cues are illegal and you have to jump with your plane cue so I would try it and I I don't even practice this I'm, it's about a quarter of a ball so I'm gonna see if I can if I can reliably get over it yeah so it did jump just enough to get over a quarter ball but I, I don't ever trust it. And I certainly wouldn't try anything like that, trying to get over a full ball or anything. And a lot of times when you're jumping, are you doing it to make the object fall or just to get an illegal hit on the... So the question is, if, I, if I'm jumping, do I'm trying to make the ball or get a legal hit? It depends on the situation. If the ball's near a pocket, I'm definitely trying to make it. Um, sometimes I'll even try to make, you know, a ball that would be, say, something like this. Um, you know, if I'm jumping that, I might be jumping and trying to make it. But there's other situations where even though this shot is makeable, this, the table may be in such a way that I actually want to hit the ball maybe a little bit on this side and send the one ball back down table and leave the cue ball up there for a safety. So it's really about just being able to aim where you want it to go and being able to hit that spot and choose the right shot for the right situation. There's a couple of little jump shots I want to show you that are actually a derivative of the regular jump shot. And... They are pretty practical in a game situation. Uh, requires a little bit of practice, but uh, they can be pretty useful. So anytime you get a little straight in on a ball, so let's say something like that, I have just a hair of an angle going into that pocket. It's very, very tight. And let's say I'm trying to play position on this ball up here. So I can always hit this and use draw and come off the rail and spin back up. But if I have that same situation and I'm down here, well, even if I draw this ball back, it's going to be very tough for me to open up the angle and get all the way back down for the nine ball. So one alternative you have is to elevate your cue a little bit and jump the cue ball into the one ball. And what that does is you're hitting the ball then up in the air it allows you to hit the ball a little thinner than you would if it was on the on the table and it basically then changes the tangent line coming off the ball so if I'm straight like this I can elevate about this far okay I didn't hit it quite hard enough but you can see I changed the tangent line instead of it going like straight into the pocket I got just enough of a change where it hit the rail and then I can put some spin on it to to alter that angle. Okay, so that time I missed the ball but got up there. So, And again, this is not something I practice. It's something I played around with when I was younger, but every once in a while it will come up and Again, if you kind of know the shot, it's just kind of a specialty shot to help get you out of a situation. So, and again, if I hit it and make the ball and don't quite get there, then I'll just play safe or whatever. But, Scott, yes. Using like level one to nine, at what level would you actually think about starting your jumping? APA two. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, APA one through nine. It, it doesn't hurt to learn shots. Uh, but again, I don't think it's really necessary. First of all, I think it's illegal to jump in AP unless you're playing Masters. Um, but it's a good thing to play around with. I'd say, you know, when you're in that four, five, six category, you know, you might as well play with it. Some people are, 
there are people I know that are lower skill levels that are just good at some of these specialty shots. And if it's a strength, it's a weapon. So I would cultivate it if you're, uh, if you're good at it. So I'm going to try this just one more time because it's bugging me that I didn't get up there. So. There we go. You give me enough tries, I will make almost any shot. So. Um, another good application is, and I've had this come up and I've hit this over the years in a, in a game. Say you're playing eight ball. And uh, you know, you got your last solid and you're somewhere like here. You know, and you got something like that and you play shape, you come around for some reason and you get perfectly straight in on the seven. So now you're, you're here and you can't go straight down the table and play the eight over in that other corner. Same kind of principle. If you hit the ball and jump it a little, you can catch the nose of the cushion on the way down and it will alter the path of the cue ball. Mm -hmm. So you can aim this just like a regular shot, just elevate about 10 or 15 degrees. And if all goes well, I should catch the nose of the cushion Please give me a shot. There we go. Okay. So it looks like a trick shot, quote unquote, and there's a lot of shots in artistic pool and things that are based on normal principles playing pool. I have used that several times over the years when I've had to get position on a shot. It doesn't have to be that exact shot. It could be any time where you want the cue ball to hop and kind of move over a little bit. And change your tangent line, exactly. Another good example is you're shooting the ball like this, and there's a ball right here. So if I hit this with draw, I'm going to draw right back into the eight ball, right? So if I just hit a normal shot, I'm going to hit the eight ball. The key ball's not going to go anywhere. But if I elevate my cue a little bit, I can make the cue ball bounce sideways before the draw takes effect. And again, I'm not talking like a full jump shot, so I'll launch it right off the table just a little bit. Okay. So I've used that a ton of times when I'm playing pool to create an angle. And again, it's just a, it's just a normal stroke. Just elevate like 10 or 15 degrees and just practice it. And um, you can actually jump over a whole ball doing the same thing. So if I'm trying to go sideways let's say I have a little I can do the same thing just elevate a little bit and just hop right over the ball so again all like little variations of that jump shot <laughs> another one that I like Grady Matthews had a fantastic video back in the day I still have a VHS copy if anybody has a player that they can <laughs> they can watch it on but he set up shots, I won't go through all eight of them, but he set up straight in shots down here and showed eight different ways to get up table for the nine ball. And um, some of them were pretty ridiculous. And one of the ones that I loved and I started practicing was the same kind of variation. So again, I want to hit the cue ball up in the air, bounce off the nose of the cushion and get the cue ball to come up that way. Okay. Now you have to hit it just right, but just the fact that you even get off the rail like half a table usually would, would be enough. No, 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 just, I'm just hopping the ball up in the air and trying to get it to basically do one of those where it comes down on the nose of the cushion. I hit a little high on the table, so it, it kind of just, it didn't catch. I'll try it one more time. I can also do it with right English, like you said. That would be a different variation of the shot. So I'll, I'll try that actually, just to see. So I'd hit this with like high right, essentially. So I can spin it that way too, if I want, with the right English. So it just depends on where the ball is. <coughs> so let me talk just a little bit about curve and mass A shots. Again, this is like even worse than the jump shots as far as trying to practice this. Um, I used to hit them quite a bit when I played three cushion. I had a room owner, com room owner come over to me one time and 
oh, you can't be doing that. And I shot the shot in front of him. It was a four rail mass A and I didn't cloth with my stick. And then he's like, well, you can do it, but don't do it because other people will try to do it. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> but again, if you all watch like Mike Massey, you know, Venom, you watch any of those trick shot guys, I mean, they're, I'm sure they've broken sticks, ferrules, balls even, ripped felt. You have to when you're hitting those types of extreme mass A's. But the main thing when you're shooting like a, a curve shot, let's say, and I do this, this comes up often enough where it's worth practicing because people will play safe on you. And sometimes it's hard to kick. And sometimes your best shot is to curve around the ball a little bit. So right now I'm obscured by about half a ball. So that's not too bad to do. The main thing is you want to clear this ball and you have to get enough spin on the ball so that it curves. The way you can estimate that is whenever you're elevated on the cue ball, the cue ball is going to go in the direction the stick is pointing. That's going to be the initial direction. So if I elevate like this, the ball is going to go in that direction. The way I make it curve over there is I have to look at, I have to visualize where the bottom of this ball is on the cloth. And wherever my tip is pointing, I extend that through the ball and wherever that lands on the cloth, that line between the diagram or something, but um, so if I elevate like this, if I project my tip through, my tip would be like right here. So when I look at the center of the cue ball to there, that means the ball is going to go in that direction when it's done sliding. If I elevate really high, like a mass A shot, my tip would be here, the center's here, it's going to go straight that way. So the higher you go, the more extreme the curve is going to be. So when I line these up, oh, and it's going to curve based on how hard you hit it. If you hit it really soft, it's going to curve right away. If you hit it hard, it's going to go longer down the line before it curves. So when I see a shot like this, I picture about halfway, and then that's the curve I want. So I try to get my tip to be in that direction. So I don't have to elevate very high for that, right? And I'd be able to play a return safety on somebody or, or make the ball or whatever. Now, if it's a little more extreme, or if I'm closer to the ball, right? Now this would be a very difficult shot, especially with the lower deflection cue. But now I gotta probably elevate to where I'm 60 degrees or something. But I wanna aim, ha I have to clear the ball and then it's got to curve a fair amount. So, oops. And again, for me, the, I wouldn't shoot it so quickly in a, in a match. Probably aiming would help. Okay, so you can see it, it curved. You would probably kick that oh, 100%. Especially yeah, especially if it's sitting there on the diamond like that. Yeah, all day long because I feel like I could probably have a pretty good chance of making it, at least hitting it, you know. So, but it is good to know. I will almost never shoot a full mass A in a game of eight ball or nine ball once this whole year to give you an idea. I mean, it does come up. Sometimes it's all you have. I uh, have seen professionals do it, again, very, very occasionally in a match, but it's, it's generally not needed. Usually just a little curve shot is enough to get the job done. And again, I showed before how you can kind of combine the jump with the mass A a little bit too, right? You can jump with a bunch of spin and then you kind of get that nice curve effect too. So, so any questions on the breaking or jumping or no, curve no, shots? Sure. Yeah. No, because the jump cue would be so light that it would actually not dig in on the English enough. And, the, and you know, if you are going to do it, you won't really damage a table. Again, it's not a good thing to be practicing them a lot in the room. But the main thing is you don't want to be too close to the center because you'll trap the ball. And you don't want to be out toward the edge because that's where people do this and they slide off the edge of the cue ball and they hit the felt at an angle and that's what causes those little rips that you'll see. But if you come straight down and you're about halfway between the middle and the edge of the ball, you're not really going to hurt anything if you do it. And, and some people, you know, you see, I see guys all the time, they're like this. It's not necessarily a power thing. 
Trick shots, yes, but when you're playing, you see me, I'm either going to hold the cue like this or I'm going to hold it like this. It's not a, you know, that kind of a shot. If I had to hit this ball like this, I'll even do a good example. It, this doesn't come up hardly at all, but, you know, if I had a ball sitting like here, you know, and I'm sitting somewhere like this, and there's, and there's balls everywhere, and I couldn't kick at it, I mean, again, it's not going to be some big, massive trick shot looking masse. I'm going to try to get just around the four ball and picture how much spin I need just to get down there to hit the seven. So it doesn't need to be firm. So again, I'm going to picture my path going this way and then picture how much elevation and spin I need. Right, so it doesn't have to be, I didn't even hardly touch the cloth or anything. It's not going to hurt anything. Now obviously when you practice that, y you might, you know, break some eggs, so to speak, before you make the omelet. But, uh, <laughs> but, but once you get the little technique down, it's not a big power thing. It's just kind of a control. So, any other questions? In general or for this in type of stuff? In general. Yeah. 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 So the question was about just recommending good books or videos. Again, there's a ton of content on YouTube these days. Uh, it's amazing how much is out there. Um, too much. And some of it is not very good and, and actually mis misinformation. But there is some good stuff out there. And uh, for books, though, I'm kind of old school. That's how I learned. Uh, that's all we had back in the day were, were books, so I ordered them every time they came out. I, I think you can't go wrong with, like, Robert Byrne, any of his books, a standard book of pool and billiards, and then he's got the advanced book. They're very, very good. I learned a lot of stuff from his books. His writing style is great. And then uh, Phil Capel, another kind of buddy of mine, he's, he's awesome. He's, he's got probably eight or nine books, play your best pool, play your best nine ball, play your best eight ball, straight pool. they got a couple of them here. Uh, very, very thorough, very, very good. He's also a regular contributor to like Billiard Digest every month and uh, very good uh, analyst for the game. Those would be my two top picks. I have probably between 90 and 100 books at home. I don't read them anymore, but for reference every once in a while, I've got some specialty books too, but uh, that's how I learned back in the day. So, Thank you. sure. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, like I said, I'll be here for a couple hours and uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs>